What? Is something odd? My glasses are broken and I felt like we needed a finishing touch. So, no, actually I'm gonna take them off. It's going to be, <laughs> wow, very strange because I always wear glasses in my videos. They are my security blanket. They are the finishing touch, but unfortunately they can no longer participate for a couple of days here or probably a week or so. And you know, I'm sorry, this is jarring, but here we are. Today, we are going to talk about self-watering pots. Also, the mic cannot go anywhere else on my shirt, so I feel like I need a chain, but I don't wear any jewelry except for the watch. Wait, can I put them on my glasses? Does that look like fashion? It sort of does. I sort of look fashionable. I am very delusional. <laughs> I don't want to be holding my mic all the time, but also it cannot really go on my shirt because of the fabric, and I don't have any necklaces. So if you want to get me pearls so I can put my mic on them, I will be okay with that. Anyway, to everyone's surprise, I was visiting Hoya groups again, and I saw this post about using self-watering pots for Hoyas, and I started to write out a reply, and after, you know, spending 15 minutes on it, trying to phrase it, trying to reply to this question to the best of my possibility, I realized, wow, that's a whole essay there, and it's full of ifs and buts, and I don't think that comments, or like this advice via comments, comes across well on Facebook. You know, people see a bunch of text and they're like, yeah, I'm not gonna read that or I'm just gonna skim through it. And I think they people do this with the videos as well. I just don't think based on some of the comments that people are really watching or listening. But anyways, that's not the point of this video. But I decided to make a video on this topic and that's why we are here. As you know, you have seen the title. It's not a surprise. I have tried to make this as structured and as brief as possible because I did write sort of topics that I would like to cover and naturally that means it will be HBO miniseries. I'm gonna really try to reply to everything that I have been asked in the past and hopefully this will just cover all of the questions that people have had, all of the doubts about self-watering pots for Hoyas. Since we are going to be talking about plants and you know taking care of our plants, their well-being, I think it is also important to take care of our own well-being as well. And that is why I'm happy to take a brief moment to talk about the sponsor of today's video, BetterHelp. Listen, past few weeks have brought some interesting things my way on the winds of stress and anxiety. I think if we make it poetic like that, it will make it sound better. That, that's how it works, right? I can be a bit of a double handful <laughs> when I'm a bit stressed out because I tend to spiral a bit. And when I spiral, I don't always spiral inwards though, that happens. I also sometimes spiral outwards, meaning that in order to process something that is going on, which you know requires perhaps a lot of work, I tend to, you know, go to my friends, talk to them, you know, I'm gonna do this and this and this, and you know, lay out all of these plans to them so I can get the feedback and they can tell me, yeah, that, that sounds like a good plan there. But if you receive a message like this from your friend, well, first of all, congratulations, you have amazing powers there. But second, it may be beneficial to give your friends second or third or the fourth draft of your thoughts. Therapy can help you if you're going through a difficult period in your life or if you have clinical mental health issues such as depression or anxiety, and it can certainly help you lead your life in a better way. Today's sponsor, BetterHelp, makes starting therapy easier, less intimidating because it is online. And for that reason, it is also more affordable, it is more accessible, and it's a great solution if you don't have viable options for therapy in your area. Join over 4 million people who have used BetterHelp to start leading healthier and happier lives. You can click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com slash basyplants. That is betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash basyplants. All you need to do is fill out a few questions, and in most cases, you will be matched with a professional therapist, usually within 48 hours. BetterHelp has a network of over 30,000 therapists, and you can be matched one that is right for your needs, for your lifestyle, and that matches your personal preferences. You can also choose to have therapy sessions via video call, via phone call, or even text messages, whatever is the most comfortable for you. If for whatever reason you don't vibe with a the therapist that you 
get matched with, no worries, it is very easy to switch to a new therapist free of charge. BetterHelp makes this very easy with a click of a button in your settings so it does not have to feel like a breakup. So if you're struggling, consider online therapy with BetterHelp. Once again, you can click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com slash basyplans. That is betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash basyplans. Clicking that link helps support me and my channel, and it is also good for you because I got you a 10% off deal of your first month of BetterHelp, so you can see if online therapy is right for you. Thank you again, BetterHelp, for sponsoring this video, and thank you all for listening. And now we can start talking about the pots. I actually don't think I read this question slash this post to you, so here it is. I'm sort of confused with using self-watering planters for Hoyas. From what I have seen, too much water will cause root rot. Roots should dry out. With self-watering planters, the roots are getting water all the time. What keeps the Hoya from being overwatered? Okay, let us try to cover all of it in one video. <laughs> the last time I looked at that post, most of the answers said that it is possible to grow Hoyas in self-watering pots, but you can do it in pond, or you should do it in pond. And I am here to tell you, you do not have to do it in pond only. I've made a couple of videos there about pond. You can grow it in pond, and I will absolutely keep some of mine in pond that are still okay because I'm too lazy to transition but I'm not going to keep most of them. That's not the point of this video. I will show you several plants in different potting mixes. First, why is it beneficial, in my opinion, to grow in self-watering pots? It can be a great solution if you have a very large plant collection. I don't think I have super large plant collection, but there are 400 Hoyas and let's say, I wanna say 20 more other plants, but that is absolutely untrue. There are more plants than that, and also there are propagations that I never count, and there are probably more than 400 hoods. But let's say there are perhaps 450 plants here. And I don't think that's a super large collection, but we also have to understand that a normal amount of plants that people usually have in their homes is like no more than 10, so it's quite large in my opinion, actually. It can help you deal with large collections and stay on top of watering. In most cases, it is difficult or it's more difficult than via the regular method to make a mistake when it comes to watering because the plants take how much water they need. You have the reservoir. Most of my pots have a window, but I do have a couple of different types of pots and you can see how much water is there. When they drink the water, you refill the reservoir. That's it. It's difficult to make mistakes with watering. Again, I will talk about the nuances here because there are many, which is why I called this HBO miniseries, right? And I think with traditional growing methods, if people are novices to some of these plants, it can be challenging. It's much easier to make a mistake, especially with Hoyas, especially with some of the mixes they come in. Footnote here is if you're not very observant, you may never know what your plant actually needs if you don't watch them closely. And it's quite interesting actually to watch plants that are seemingly similar, similar thickness of the leaves and in the same substrate in self-watering pots and you can see how differently they drink water. But that's not the topic of this video. Another benefit, in my opinion, is you can go on vacations and you don't have to worry about plants. You don't have to ask someone to come and, you know, be a plant sitter for you. You don't have to ask your friends, neighbors, or to put them in the bathtub or whatever it is that people do, put them on a wet towel. You don't have to do any of that. All you need to do is fill out the reservoirs and then you are free to go. So I do believe that's a benefit. It also helps if you have a very busy lifestyle, if you have a lot of work, especially now when a lot of people are back in their offices. I think it really helps because, you know, when you work from nine to five or I don't know, whatever your working time is, it can be difficult that, you know, you have to water some plants twice a week or whatever. And of course, the solution to that could be to downsize. But if you like having so many plants, I think there's nothing wrong with using self-watering pots. I think they can be a great option. Another benefit to self-watering pots is if you meet the plant's other conditions aside from watering, so light, humidity, temperature, they are more likely to grow more consistently. Some species are very difficult to grow in the traditional way. And I will show, I think, a couple of examples here in the back. 
and I think that I probably could not grow them without self-watering pots considering my watering habits and even in self-watering pots sometimes it's a challenge to keep up. So there are definitely many benefits and I will talk at the end of the video if you stay tuned and you should. I will talk about the pros and the cons in my opinion of self-watering pots. Let's just quickly talk about the misconception in that post and in the comments and that is a very common misconception in the plant community and that is that the plants will rot because they have access to water. Many people much smarter than me have talked about this. Roots simply don't rot because they have access to water. They don't rot because of water because if that were true you would not be able to water propagate them. So it's not actually true. They don't rot because of water. What will make them rot is the janky mix that is very compact and when there is no oxygen because roots, just like any other part of the plant, they need oxygen. Roots demand access to oxygen. It is necessary for gas exchange, for turning carbohydrates into sugars that plant uses, and it is necessary for respiration, just like in the leaves the roots also need access to oxygen. And when you have a mix that is very compact or that's just not very well aerated and when you add water to it, it pushes out the oxygen. Because of this, you have opportunistic bacteria that will take advantage of this situation and they will start to multiply at a very rapid rate and that will affect the roots and hence, you know, the rot will start. So if you have a proper mix and self-watering pot, access to water is not an issue. And you know, just in regular pots as well, access to water is never really the issue. I know that because of dry rot, people sometimes think they overwater their plant, but in many cases they underwater their plants. I think that's, I think because of the dry rot, people really, really struggle with their plants because they keep thinking it's overwatering. And I think we just forget that we underwater our plants too. I underwater my Hoyas all the time. I'm not proud of it. And I will tell you, I have underwatered a Hoya in self-watering pot as well, which has destroyed the roots. And you can say, oh, they rotted because of too much water. But I know that's not the case. I know what I did. I know what I did. And I am ashamed of it. Putting that misconception aside, I have grown and I am growing my Hoyas in a variety of mixes and self-watering pots. Now, I will say I would not, there are certain mixes in which I wouldn't grow at all. <laughs> not just in self-watering pots, but you know, regular pots as well. The mixes that I have used, or that I am using actually in, in no particular order is pure pumice, pawn, and then I have grown in bark and moss, bark, moss, and pumice, cocoa husk, pure cocoa husk, and then I think bark, perlite, and cocoa peat, and perhaps some cocoa chips in there. Quite a variety of mixes, and I have plants here that I can show you what they look like. Varying results, right? Sometimes I get the mix right, sometimes I don't get the mix right. I think we should start with inorganic mixes, and a couple of these plants will be under, okay, one or two will be underwatered. And we, it's a great opportunity to also talk about these pots and the different mixes and how they influence how I grow the plants. You will understand everything when I show the plants to you. First, we have this Hoya Pubicorolla. She is in bloom. We need to take photos of the flower. I don't even know. This is supposed to be pink dragon. I don't think it's the pink dragon that I wanted. I actually think Rachel told me, Rachel Clant Conroy, that this is Bobby Corolla subspecies Antrachina. As you can see, this is growing in pond and there is a little bit of water in that reservoir and it is doing well. I actually find that Bobby Corollas grow really well in pond even when you repot them, which was the topic of one of my previous videos. Now this is a self-watering pot with a little window and I don't think these are super useful. It's just very difficult to see, especially with the algae buildup, which will happen when you have a translucent or a transparent pot or even a window. It's enough that light gets in and algae will start to grow. But it's sort of helpful. Maybe if I didn't crowd my plants, I would be able to see that window, but it's doing really well in this mix. Some roots are growing out on the bottom, but not too many. This has this wick that sometimes gets a bit 
nasty. I don't like that. And then you can see there is a bit of water there that really needs to be washed. It feels sometimes like when I show you these self-watering pots, when I show you the pot, what it looks like inside, it feels like dirty underwear, honestly, that I'm showing to you. <laughs> Which is probably very dramatic and not like that at all, right? A lot of people ask me, by the way, about these pots. And let me reply to this one more time. These are pots made by company Santino, not sponsored. And they are made by company Santino, and I think they are from Moldova. I don't know if you can find them on Amazon. People ask about these a lot, especially because they're clear ones. And I know that everyone is, like, obsessed with these when they see them. I'm just going to tell you I'm not happy with them. Sometimes it's a bit difficult to take the plant out. Now it's not because I'm holding it in the air and I'm, like, catching the pot. But if I put it on the desk... Okay, sometimes I have issues taking these out. Not now. Maybe I've gotten bat better at it, but my friend, please, Diana, if you're watching the video, leave a comment. She ha actually struggled when I was sick to take the plants out of these pots, especially if your hands are wet, if you're showering the plants, then it is super difficult. But this is one that is in pond and it's doing really well. So I'm just gonna put her here. Now, the next one is a little bit underwatered. This one is also in pond and this is Hoya Mitrata. You can see her in bloom as well. Did I pick Hoyas that were in bloom? Yes, I totally did. Is that cheating? Absolutely not. So this one is doing really well. It has another set of buds here. It has grown a lot in self-watering and it really loves it. As you can see, some of the leaves are a bit wrinkly and that's because this plant is wrapped around this twice or thrice so she's quite long, I think maybe two and a half meters, something like that. I know that she doesn't look maybe big on camera, but trust me, she is. And she drinks water like crazy. Now this pot, this self-watering pot is a bit different and I honestly don't recommend this. This one was from Amazon and it was actually quite expensive. It has a shelf here on the inside. So it's a raised bottom. And the way that this works, you cannot actually take the plant out. So this is not permanently potted. You can always unpot it, but unlike this one, you cannot just take this out. Uh, so I don't think there is a wick inside. I think some of the substrate makes contact with the, with the reservoir and that's how it drinks water. It's actually quite similar to this on the inside. I don't know if you can see how these extend. You can see. So that shelf actually looks like that, but as if I, if I were to cut through this, that's what it looks like. So it has these little whatever, and they make contact with the reservoir, so substrate is in them. This can be a bit tricky, and I actually did rot a Hoya in this, not this one, but my Hoya Praetori. I rotted it because that one was not in pawn. That one was in Coco Peat and Perlite, and I do have Hoyas in self-watering pot in Coco Peat and Perlite, that multiflora that you have just seen, and she's doing really well. But there is an issue with this design, and that is, depending on the potting mix, it's very easy to overwater your Hoya. In this case, it's not. I think this is fine. You can just lift the pot, and you can put the water in the reservoir, and then put it back. Also, it's easy to empty. If you top water and you just overfill, it's easy to empty. In this one, since you cannot take the plant out, you, you have to rely on this indicator here which you can hopefully see. I'm sorry, I cannot really maneuver this well. So there is this indicator, right? And even in pawn, what happens is you start to put water in here and the indicator is not so fast to go up. And that was the issue with my Praetori with uh, Coco Peat and Perlite because the water just, you know, in, if you have grown in organic mixes, it takes a bit more time for the water to go down there. And I do know that some pots like this do have like an opening here so you can pu put the water directly in the reservoir. This one doesn't. And I wasn't thinking about all of these when I was buying the pot. Simply, you know, sometimes if you don't use it, you cannot spot all the flaws of the design. And this is a very, very, very flawed design in my opinion. And this Metrata now often also goes dry because I try not to overwater it. 
and sometimes they do, sometimes this red line, or not the red line, the red pointy thingy, whatever, the indicator, it goes all the way to the top, meaning that I have overfilled it, so then I tip out the water and it's a whole mess. So I would not get anything like this. If you you know see these on Amazon, just think twice. In this type of a pot, I don't think anything else works but pawn or maybe just bark with a bit of moss or a bit of pumice. I just don't think traditional mixes would do really well because it's just very difficult to navigate this pot, especially if you are in a rush or even if you're showering your plant, then you can overwater very easily. And with this one, that's just much more difficult to happen. Despite all the issues with the pot, Mitrata did well, and I am sorry for underwatering it. We have Hoya Xillis here, and this one has done extremely well in this self-watering pot, and it could have done even better. I have underwatered this several times. You Maybe it's a bit less lush than before. Luckily, there was no root rot that happened, but she really, really drinks water a lot. I don't think I would be able to grow a plant like this in a traditional pot. It's just way too thirsty, way too dramatic, and I think it would be super difficult to grow her the regular way. You would have to water her several times a week because it still needs aeration, so you would have to have like a loose mix and make sure that she is constantly watered, right? So that would make it very difficult. In this case, I, for me at least, I would say it's necessary to grow this plant well because when grown well, she can grow really fast. And, you know, if she dries out, then it can be really a struggle. But you will see there are roots in the reservoir. They're green because of the algae, but they stay in that water and there's nothing wrong with them. By the way, some people in my pond video said because I put leca on the bottom, and the reason I put lack on the bottom of these pots is even though they have huge holes, pawn can sometimes clog them. It actually happened with my paradisa despite the leca. And I wanted to just make sure that if pawn, because as a water, sometimes pawn will have this dust runoff. I just thought leca would perhaps help with that, not accumulate on the bottom somewhat, but not a lot. But anyways, people have said that the issue is because they have leca on the bottom and then pond and it's not wicking. Well, it's absolutely wicking. You can see that the roots are growing really well in there around the leca, around the pond. So yeah, and the roots were above the reservoir. They were, um, it was a very small plant actually when I put it here. I put two or three cuttings and I let them grow. But anyways, you know, let's find more excuses for pond. Back to Hoya Exilis. I think this would be just really challenging to grow any different way that is not a self-watering pot. It does bloom a lot too, so it's clearly working for this one. I have one more, and this one, I actually don't even know why I brought this out. I think I just brought it because I thought she looked pretty, to be quite honest. This is my Hoya Puvuaensis, and oh, I just love this plant so much. I had to show it to you. I don't know. Hoya Puvuaensis is a really slow grower, in my opinion, but she has done really well in self-watering. This is in pond. Here we can see we have the roots going into the reservoir, so it's completely fine. You can actually see here the mud from pond. You can see that accumulating. So that needs to be absolutely fixed. There is no leca in this one, and there is definitely significant pond dust buildup. Love it. You can also grow Hoyas like these. I find that Hoyas like Caudata and Puvoaensis, aside from these thin-leaved Hoya like uh, Exilis and Paradisa, also do not like to dry out. Since we're talking actually about roots drying out, another note for that post, roots should not dry out completely. That is a bad, bad thing. You will get dry root rot happened so many times. Believe me, you should not let them dry out that much. When we say plant needs to dry out, we're typically, in most severe cases, talking about maybe first two thirds of the pot, but not really all the way bone dry to the bottom, or in most cases. I don't know much about growing cacti, maybe there, or maybe a Hevarias, et cetera. This is another one in pond doing well. Don't say I didn't say anything nice about that potting mix. Now it's time to move on to the organic mixes, and I have several different mixes. Well, not really mixes because some of them are impure cocoa husk, 
But let's start with the most basic one, which actually would be cocoa husk. So I, I guess let's do that. This is Hoya verticillata, inner variegated, which used to be a very slow grower for me, but now she's actually really fast. She likes my small grow tent. This one is very, very big, still refuses to bloom. I got this as Hoya melliflua. I do believe it's some type of a pubicorolla because it has a clear sap and it's absolutely not a melliflua. This one I recently trellised. By recently, I mean just before this video. This is Hoya from Vietnam that currently doesn't have an ID, but I do believe this is Hoya nutans. So all of these three are in pure cocoa husk that has been buffered. So I will just show you how they're doing. They do have all three of them, I believe, a layer of LECA. Again, dirty underwear, dirty underwear. You can see that this one doing quite well in just pure cocoa husk. Am I even showing you anything? I'm trying not to drip here. We do have roots there on the bottom because there are different particles in, in this cocoa husk that I buy. Some of them are actual chips um, and some of them are smaller. It's actually a good wicking media, I guess. Hoya, which I believe to be Hoya Newtons, um, is actually much younger than the one that you just saw. This is only maybe four or five months old. I had to restart it, arrived with root mealybugs, had to treat it, chopped it into cuttings, etc. And we have a lot of nice roots here that have gone green with envy. Doing really well in the cocoa husk. And then the last one, which initially was not in cocoa husk, but I did transition it and is doing super nice, is this, whatever this is. Now, as you can see, this one actually I did let dry out. And sometimes I will let them dry out in self-watering, which I will explain, but you can see a mass of roots, ton of roots, ton of roots everywhere. Obviously outside of the pot, we have roots. So it's doing really well. That is the simplest mix that you can use that is organic if you don't want to use spawn. If you are braver, now things get more complicated. This is cocoa peat and perlite. I don't have one in see-through pot, I believe. So we'll just go with unsee-through, which I believe there is a word for that. This is her glabra, ulu apin apin, and it's a beautiful plant. It's actually quite big. It's very tightly wrapped around, which I don't think is a great look. I have to do something with it. It looks like it just threw the vine on there, but I also do like that it really covers this trellis, but yeah, I don't know. I'll think about what to do with it. It's actually not saving me any space, but huge leaves, we can see there, compared to my pretty large head. So she's doing really well. This is in a mix that is pure cocoa, peat and perlite, about half and half mix. Now this will be difficult to show, but let's try. No matter how I turn it, it's difficult to see. So you can see that is a bit compact there. That was the whole point of this, to show you that this does compact over time. Cocoa peat tends to kind of, just regular peat, it tends to become hydrophobic, especially if you don't water for a long time. And it just tends to, I don't know what's the word, but like turn into sort of a brick, not really a brick, you can, still aerate it if you just take uh, those skewers. There are many roots on the top, so that is also the reason why it's all sort of matted there. Now I'm just digging through the mix here, and it's doing really well. Now this mix did not work out for all of my Hoyas. I tried it with several, and this is what I'm talking about. You can see this plant drinks a lot of water, some of them even faster than Hoya glabra, and some of them were still in this mix, and approximately the same size, same thick leaves, not the same species, but a different species. And I noticed that when I need to refill this glabra because she's so thirsty, that other plant has drunk only half of the water from the reservoir. 
And in those cases, the cocoa peat was just not the best mix because it would stay way too wet for way too long. I will say one more thing here though. Some Hoyas seem to like that. My Hoya Amrita likes that. Tang Chokansis and Serpents, which I have showed in previous videos, seem to love being constantly damp. It makes me super uncomfortable, but the roots look great. On this one, we can see there are roots here that go into the reservoir, which is currently empty. So this is Coco Peat and Perlite. This can be a tricky mix. It's a learning curve. Now we have two, and that's actually one. So let's grab the other one. We have Hoya Flavida, I think, from Mount Gallego, and Hoya Nathalie. This is Nathalie, one of my two Nathalies. And then this is Hoya Flavida, which the red leaves are due to now being colder, actually. Let me just use something to secure that vine. So this mix is coco peat, perlite. There is a bit of laca. I think it was just some rogue pieces. And then a, just a tiny bit of moss. It's supposed to be a very airy mix, and it is. We can see less roots going into the reservoir with this species. And they're potted at the same time, I believe. A bit more with this one. Both of them are doing really well in this mix. So once again, this is not pawn. Honestly, this whole segment is to prove to you they can do well in organic mixes. You just have to get the right organic mix. Let's bring you closer. Um, you absolutely see nothing. I don't know if you're actually seeing anything there, but Maybe I will take B-roll of that. And then my Hoya undulata that I restarted this fall, or last fall, it's mirror, it's 2024. It's grown a lot of leaves at the Domitia. It's pushed out a large vine and a couple of more leaves on the top. This one is in bark and moss. Mostly bark, very bit of moss for wicking. So you can see there what that looks like. And I do believe it has some roots. Yeah, not a lot of roots going into the reservoir. More, more, more roots are just on the wick. You can see this one is a bit dry because the leaves are more pliable than they usually are. <sighs> okay, that was a workout. So the results can vary here. And I would say pawn can be very good. I think the least amount of error initially happens in pawn. Over time, I'm not happy with it for the reasons I mentioned in my previous video. More error can happen in organic mixes. That's absolutely true. I'm not here to trick anyone, but over long term, I find them to work better for me and for my conditions. You know, all of this is a learning curve. Everything is a learning curve. And you know what? I'm tired of it. <laughs> I'm tired. Let's cancel learning curves in 2024. Like for once, can it not be a learning curve? I'm just talking about things in general. Can it not be a learning curve? In fact, can it be something that's opposite of a curve? And I know that someone will think line, but mm -mm, you're not going to get me there because I have learned math and I have seen linear functions and those motherfuckers are steep. So absolutely not. We shall not. I shall not be tricked by saying a line. But anyways, let's move on from that analogy. Was it analogy? Was it digression? Who knows? With organic mixes, there will be more learning, but I feel that you will also get to really know your Hoya and what she wants. Even in self-watering pots, which I do feel sometimes can be a crutch, I have said it, it's true, and I admit to using that crutch all the time. You can also still notice things if you are very observant, how much water some plant wants or doesn't want. Typically, it's not even a big issue if you make a mistake, you can always restart your plant. I don't actually think I have ever killed a plant because of self-watering pot per se. Even the ones in pond that I made a video a couple of videos ago, those could have been saved earlier. The reason why I didn't is because I have a lot of other plants to work with. So those kind of 
were supposed to recover themselves. They didn't. But if I took cutting earlier, I would have absolutely saved them. Make no mistake there. So to conclude here, no, you don't only have to grow in pond in self-watering pots. There is a variety of mixes. I'm sure there are mixes that you have tried out here that I haven't. But with organic mixes, I feel that it will be a tougher learning curve. I will say one thing. I think the least mistakes that you will make is if you do bark and a bit of moss with pumice, because it's just going to be much harder for that to get waterlogged. That's a very airy mix. It's a very good mix. I did opt for cocoa peat and perlite because it's the cheapest. It's most available to me. We don't have good bark here. It's always filled with fungus gnats. We don't have moss and we don't have pumice. That's why I also don't want to use pond. So I tried just cocoa peat and perlite. It's a hit and miss. Sometimes it's a hit, super hit. Sometimes it's a super miss with self-watering. Something that I find so far that's easily accessible to me and works great is cocoa husk, but that has to be buffered. It takes a long time to do that. It is physically a laborious process and I don't like that there is sometimes a bit too much dust. You know, a lot of the dust gets washed away when I buffer because I make sure to shower the, the cocoa husk. But again, not super ideal sometimes, but I have not had any issues. I have transferred a lot of Hoyas to this. When I say a lot, maybe 20, 30 to this. And so far they're doing really well. I think it's also important to say that I'm not growing every single Hoya this way. I'm growing a lot of my Hoyas, especially the plants that I've had for a while that are bigger plants. I grow this way that are on the shelves. I grow this way. I don't grow my hanging Hoyas this way because I don't have hanging self-watering pots. I can hack this probably, but in some I have so far found they don't super love it. My Hoya Sulaviziana does better with no reservoir. And let's actually get into this right now. I would say the flexibility of these pots. In self-watering pots, a good thing is that they work really well, especially in summer when there is a lot of light, there is a lot of sun, especially when you don't grow with artificial lights. You will notice that in summer, you know, your plants are going to grow really fast. But also, you know, summers are extremely warm and plants require a lot more water. So it will be much easier to have a self-watering pot because you're less likely to underwater your plant in summer. So I find them super useful. And in summer, they kind of all get to the same schedule where I water or I refill the reservoirs at the same time. Some like this exilis, which is a very thin leaved Hoya, will need more water in summer. So it's actually great to have a pot with a reservoir because it makes it so much easier. I don't know how I would handle her in summer if I didn't have this. For me, I do have artificial lights in my tents, in my room, but the temperature will drop from, you know, in summer it can be 30, in winter it's around 22. So some Hoyas will require less water. And then what I will do is I will either not use the reservoir function, which I find great, so you can opt to use it, or not to use it in winter. Some will still require a lot of water in winter, so I will refill it. And in pond, I don't think this is typically a big issue. In organic mixes, it can be because they can stay far too wet for far too long. So that is why you saw that some of these pots are empty. With some of them, it is 100% me not staying on top, like with my Hoya Loki, which I don't know if you can see here my Hoyalaki and Multifloras. These actually just got water. This is a huge self-watering pot with a very ineffective reservoir, but this one is actually also in bloom. Oh my gosh, how lucky to grab a Hoya in bloom. These types of Hoyas that are thin-leaved Hoyas, they will need a full reservoir in winter. You can still get away with not doing that as I have, but you know, expect that they're not gonna love it expect some leaf drop. So this one is not a particular fan of me not giving her enough moisture in winter either. But you know, such is life. Also be wary with pots that are very big. I don't understand, which I mentioned in a previous video, why this pot has a reservoir that's up to this and it's this size of the pot and why something like this has a much higher reservoir 
Like, let's just compare the volume here. This is the reservoir, this is the pot. I think they actually fit the same amount of water, but clearly this is for a larger plant. So I just don't really understand why this reservoir isn't bigger, but that's just a rant for another video, isn't it? To get back to my topic, what I really love is this flexibility that you can opt to use the reservoir and you can opt not to. And there will be times for me, especially in summer, and now as it's getting warmer, actually spring and summer and even fall, where I will need to use the reservoir with all plants at all times. In winter, I can let some of them go dry. So I know I oftentimes make a joke how I underwater my plants, etc., whatnot, but actually they don't really need it. So yeah, not all of them. That one could have used it. So let's just sort of make some final thoughts slash resume here at the end. So what are the pros in my opinion? It is much easier to handle large plant collections if you are busy or if you travel a lot and if you travel anyways, if you just don't have to worry about the plants. It helps you stay on top of watering. You will get more consistent growth with your plants and there is more room for a mistake. Some of the cons, I would say that there is a trial and error with potting mixes unless you're using pond, but again, Everything, everything has pros and cons. Even that, there is a long-term con, in my opinion. So nothing is easy, or everything is easy. Maybe we could just say everything is easy, right? Self-watering pots are expensive. They are going to be more expensive than the regular pots. Even the DIY solutions are going to cost you more money. Just, you know, the simplest one, take two cups, right? The small cup and the larger cup, and that's the simplest self-watering pot. If you just used one cup, it will cost you, even in DIY version, it will cost you more than a regular pot. But I do believe that investment does pay off, especially if you find self-watering pots that are good quality. There could be potential issues in winter, depending on your temperature. That's a big con. Even in pond, there can be issues. If you grow your hoyas cold, if you let the temperature go down to 15, and with cool growing hoyas, you can definitely do that. I would not include a reservoir then. I would make sure that it's empty or that there is very little water there. So be careful with self-watering pots in winter. Another slight con is once you do have to fill out the reservoirs and water all your plants, it takes a lot more time. When you top water your plants, well, you can top water in these as well, but if you really want to fill up the reservoir, I find it easier to lift the pot and fill out the reservoir. It takes more water and it takes more time than to just, you know, water plants that are not in self-watering pots. That's been at least my experience. I know when I grew in bark and moss and in regular pots or in net pots, it was so much easier for me and quicker than it is now. And when I was growing just in pond without self-watering pot, also that was quicker. I had to do it more frequently and probably ended up using the same amount of water in the end, or maybe even a bit more, but... Yeah, it takes a bit more time. That is all for today. I hope that you enjoyed the video and found it useful. I don't know if I managed to mention all the nuances here. I tried to, but I wanted to show you that plants can do well in almost all of the mixes. You can make mistake in any of the mixes. Some are going to be more forgiving. Some are going to be less forgiving, but it's really not the self-watering pot's fault. It's really the mix, so, you know and they give you a greater flexibility with, you know, opting for or without reservoir. I mean, you have to buy it with a reservoir, of course, but just in winter, if you're gonna use it or not. Overall, I, you know, I would say I love them. They helped me a lot. This is sponsored by Self-Watering Pots. I will definitely keep growing in, in them. I will keep using both organic and inorganic mixes. And yeah, that is it. Let me know in the comments, do you use self-watering pots? What has been your experience with them? Do you like them? Do you hate them? I do find that sizes are a bit challenging. Small ones are hard to find. And also plants will frequently outgrow the small ones pretty quickly. So for, for me, I mean, this is the smallest size I can find here. That's why I see a lot of them in this size. This is 12 centimeters. I was able to get the a friend smaller ones, but you sometimes also just have to rely on yourself <laughs> and what is available to you. But anyways, 
That concludes today's video. I hope that you enjoyed it and I will see you soon in the next one. I have to put all these toys back and yeah, just hopefully the sound was good and I didn't talk into nothing. So let's just finish off how we started. I feel I should end by saying plans, basic plans. Okay, that's a definitely a no. I would like to take some time to thank all of my patrons for their incredible support. A massive shout out to my $5 patrons. My three anonymous patrons, Alex Von Siebenthal, Amber Clear, Amber Kosher, Anne Margaret Nguyen, Angela Bernard, Angela Parrish, and C. Aspen Drake, Patsy Bougie Panda, Brad Noble, Catherine Molina, Colleen Coyle Levi, Daniela Danube Daniels, Daria Kaminska, Dili Heredia, Deanne Sikorsky, Dipanjali Rao, Edith W., Erin Keenan, Ellen Isaacson, Farah Gathering Moss, Gina Geise, Go Green Tropical, Heather Uppencamp, Hoji Scott, Scott, Hoya Heather, Jamie Arsenault, Yana Griffin, Jessica Chia, Yavan Dinot, Kara, Catherine P, Casey Gross, Kelly Cool, Kelly Gallagher, Kelso, Kiwi Mochi, Christy Ehrlich, Leplan de Steff, Lisa Marie, MPLS, Lori J. Revert, Mandy Milliken, Marcel Har, Marcelia Novosansky, Maria Stein, Marina Yarmulik, Maria West, Maris B, Marty Miller, Mary Rose, Melissa Walker, Michael Curley, Michelle Heron, Nicole Ferranti, Mirka Grun Roos, Moa Edman, Nelly Yang, Nihabasu, Nicole Maroni, Nguyen, Nita Macy, PJ Plan the Druid, Rachel. Rachel Peterson, Robin L. Jennings, Sandra Cornelius, Sherry Kumar, Stephanie H2O, Tessa Martins, Tia B, TJWO, Trista Bailey, Tristan Thomas, Wendy, Wendy Foreman, Wendy Rossman, Xenia Green, Youth of the Wallamut, Zurdarama, and Zlokob Nipponi. A big thank you to my $3 patrons, Angelina Farnan, Kilon, Constance, Catherine Parsons, Lindsay Ann, Lisa Helling, Nella, Nerdy Kathy, Saig Zera, Ringlob, and Tang Watanas Riakul. And a thank you to my $1 patrons, one anonymous patron, Alice Borolin, Brandon Pacheco, Christina Green Grass, Colleen Coyle Levi, Couture Helvetica, Amelia Bronson, Joanna Pearson, Jolie Sullivan, Jonas Bayer, Hjorth Larson, Kayla Vavra, Kelly Ash, Chris Perez, Lauren M, Lori Ann Subramaniam, Luzmin Fernandez, Millie Spicer, Olivia Chen Mueller, and Tracy the Eyebiller. 